Good evening, children. Deadly Headley speaking to you once again from beyond the rusted gate. Dim your lights, turn off your monitors, and say your prayers. Do you feel that chill in the air? Good. That feeling is fear, and it means you're still alive. For now. I've brought you to the precipice, but you yourself must cross the threshold. On the other side, waiting to bring you tonight's story, is once again the master of scare himself, Sir Darkwell Bled. Don't worry, you'll have no trouble finding him. He's the one sitting by the crypt. And so go on through, my child. Go on through, beyond the rusted gate. For most people, a young family having breakfast would not be considered an unusual sight to bear witness. For 85-year-old Travis Belfire, however, having lived alone for 30-odd years, the wholesome scene taking place in his living room was curious, to say the least. Not helped by the fact that the two young parents spoke in unintelligible garbles that made them sound as if they were underwater, nor by the fact that they were, all of them at the table, semi-transparent, Mr. Belfire's intruders were strange, to say the least. Although, as he stood in the wooden doorway to the dining room, observing the busily babbled incoherence of the uninvited undead, he could not help but feel that it was he, not them, who was intruding. The ghosts in Travis Belfire's house had not always been there. In fact, not unlike the first snowfall of seasons silently arriving in the night, they had appeared quite unannounced, following a particularly sharp drop of the thermometer at the beginning of a particularly cold winter. The spirit's presence was not perpetual following the first arrival, instead opting to make seemingly random appearances. The first of which had given Mr. Belfire quite the shock, having awoken from napping in his armchair to find the little see-through ghost boy staring straight at him, an incident that has been repeated on more than one occasion. At another point, the elderly man had entered into the living room to find the not-so-living mother ironing a shirt, and in one very embarrassing moment, walked in on the fatal father during a bathroom visit. Unlike the child, however, the parents seemed to either be unaware of or unconcerned by the fact that Mr. Belfire could see them. Since then, however, he has found himself growing increasingly comfortable with their presence, often considering them guests rather than intruders. They had, after all, shown themselves to be quite harmless, and the old man found that regardless of how scientifically peculiar these poltergeists' presence were, he could only frighten so many times at the sight of the apparent apparitions going about doing activities that were, they not partaken by the undead, would have been considered perfectly normal, dull even. And all that aside, besides Travis reasoned to himself, there's very little sense in being scared of them to begin with. After all, they're all in your head. He would remind himself when ever receiving a start. You see, Mr. Belfire was, he had always felt, a very reasoned man. And while he was fairly sure ghosts did not exist, he was entirely certain old age did. He had over the last few years grown increasingly forgetful, and found at times that not only dates and names sometimes eluded him, but even entire household objects. On more than a few occasions, he had placed a book or a cup down, or so he thought, and then when trying to find it, not a moment later, learned it to be entirely lost, forcing him to question if he had forgotten where he placed it, or even truly had the object to begin with. And at one point when music had taken his fancy, he found nothing but an unrecognised lamp atop the counter he thought to house his radio. So bad had these occurrences become that he had gathered his most prized memorabilia and photos together, storing them in a shoebox at the back of his closet for safekeeping, as if trying to hide them from his own failing memory. The ghosts themselves were also not the old man's first clash with hallucinations, finding on too many occasions to count that on a perfectly clear day the old house, despite being far from noisy city life, would suddenly explode with noise and howling, as if simultaneously hit with a tornado and earthquake that would shake it to the core. When he 
first had noticed this, it had been a mere distant rumble that caused items to shake and lights to flick. However, after much time, it had grown into the symphony of terror he now heard on a daily basis. Yes, if nothing else, Bellfire reflected, at least the ghost hallucinations are relatively quiet. To begin with, in fact, they had been far quieter, with Mr. Bellfire witnessing during an early encounter with them an entire conversation take place in his kitchen between the two parents without a single audible noise escaping their excitedly animated mouths. To his surprise, the interaction ended with the husband picking up his suitcase, pecking his wife a kiss goodbye, before walking straight through the solid brick wall dividing the dining room and the kitchen. At that time, there was a soft rumble but it sounded more like a distant thunder than the ear-splitting roar he heard nowadays. And as that rumble increased, so did the vocal abilities of his guests, with their wordless mouthing growing into soft whispers, and then into unintelligible babbling, all the while their see-through nature becoming slightly more opaque, as if they were a blurred distant object observed through binoculars slowly being brought into focus. They had now, over the months of their spontaneous appearances, focused to such a degree that their speech sounded almost like it were English, until you paused to try and hear what they were saying and found it unintelligible. It was a crisp morning now, and Travis Bellfire was quietly rocking in his old wooden chair, contemplating his hallucinations. Why, for instance, he wondered, would he feel the house shake and scream on what was surely a daily or even more frequent occurrence? And what in his aged brain conjured up this family he had never seen before? He supposed it was because, as a younger man, he had had a love of the macabre. His imagined ghosts, he reasoned, moved through kitchen walls because ghosts, he had learnt from his love of fictional stories, were supposed to do that. Still, it made no real sense to Mr. Bellfire as to why his elderly brain would even try to convince him his home was haunted, if any logic can or should really be applied to one's mental deterioration whatsoever. After all, maybe he had seen the family before, but simply forgotten them, like he had done to oh so many household objects. As far as potential haunted housing goes, his home of fifty years, he felt, did not really suit the bill. After all, it was he and his wife that had built the home themselves, and so, regardless of what his mind wanted to tell him, the possibility of prior residents now residing as poltergeist was, with the exception of perhaps his deceased wife, quite preposterous. Suddenly his introspection was shattered as the ghost child entered the room. Stopping his contemplative rocking, Travis Bellfire leant forward to observe what his latest hallucinated haunting was up to. Heading straight over to the wardrobe, the pint-sized poltergeist began to rummage around amongst the wall of jackets, moving deeper into the boxed closet as he went until he eventually disappeared all the way inside. When he emerged moments later, however, what he emerged with shocked Bellfire immensely. The ghost had found and was holding Mr. Bellfire's box of most precious memories. Desperately, Mr. Belfi tried to snatch the box off the ghoulish child, but his hands passed straight through it, as if the spirit's mere touch had transported the container to another plane of existence. Or perhaps none of this was really happening, and the box was still hidden in the wardrobe, or lost long ago. Helpless, the old man could do nothing more but watch the figment of his imagination, now almost entirely opaque, sift through the photos and memorabilia, eventually coming upon his most prized item, the last photo taken of he and his late wife Betty together, which the child stared at wide-eyed before standing up and promptly running off the photo clamped carelessly in his hands. Mr. Belfire, completely dumbfounded by what he had just witnessed, stood and followed the child, feeling as if he were in a daze. He had seen the ghosts, his imagined ghosts, hold items before, but only their items. They had never interacted with anything real, But right there, running in front of him down the hallway that led to the dining room, the spirit child was holding his most guarded possession, turning left through the doorway from which Mr. Bellfire often observed the ghostly goings-on. The child ran with the old man hot on his tail, as fast as his elderly legs could carry him. But as Mr. Bellfire passed the threshold, he stopped dead as the noisy roar once more shook the home to its core.
As the otherworldly rumble carried out, Mr. Bellfire looked around in disbelief, seeing that with the shaking of his home, change was taking place, his old furniture transforming into different table and chairs that he had never seen before, and the brick wall that divided the dining room and kitchen not collapsing, but instead entirely disappearing. Shouldn't you be leaving, dear? The wife standing at the oven asked her husband in perfectly understandable English. See, he responded with a chuckle. Not only did that new train line make this house affordable, but now I'll never lose track of time, he said, crossing through the empty space between the dining room and the kitchen area to peck his wife on the cheek. As he did, the young child approached his parents, Travis Belfire's picture still clasped in his hands. With the bright sunlight shining through the window, the old man noticed with a start that none of the yellow rays managed to penetrate the ghostly figures. However, looking down at his own hands, he found he could just and so make out the dining room's tiled floor through them. "'What's that you've got there, sport?' the father asked, directing his attention to the child. "'I found a photo of the ghost,' the child responded plainly. 